Guys, we got a brand new show. I told you I had something coming up. This show, when people ask questions, they say, I don't mean to get too personal. Well, this show is actually that. We're going to get too personal. This is a brand new show on the Sure Dog Radio Network called Too Personal, where we talk to MMA stars, jiu-jitsu stars, combat sports athletes, but we take a little different uh, angle where we talk about uh, more about the in-depth personal life where pretty much nothing is off limits. I thought of who could be the first person I said, how about we get that girl who was a star of that TV show and Practical Jokers. Um, I think she also, she won like some small Uh, judo tournament uh, called the Olympics. I think she won it twice. Uh, uh, And then, uh, I don't know, she's also undefeated in MMA, won a million dollars and all that. Guys, ladies and gentlemen, it's Kayla Harrison. Thanks. What an intro. Uh, Kayla, how you doing? I'm good. I'm really good. Life is good. So, so let's talk about life is good. Let's, let's do it in reverse. Instead of starting when you were young, let's do it reverse. Let's talk about what's going on now in your life. Obviously, you, you, you matched up against Cindy Danois, June 25th. Yep. I could ask you these questions. I could ask you a prediction. I could ask you all the same questions everyone asks you. Let's be honest. You're going to smoke her. You're going to kill her. You're going to kill everyone in the competition. You're the queen. Everyone knows us. Thank you very much. <laughs> same your answer, right? Okay. Let's Yeah, let's cut to the <laughs> Let's get past all that boring stuff. <laughs> so you're a mom now. I am. Yeah, that's definitely that's what's going on with my life now. <laughs> that's so, kind of the priority. So you're you're obviously you're an ambassador for the sport. You're I don't know this nonsense about other people being the face of the PFL. You're the you're the face of the PFL. Right. And, and and while all this craziness is going on, you decide to add two children to your life. Just explain yeah. to us what exactly happened. Yeah. Um so my niece and my nephew, um, I call them my son and my daughter now, but they are were under the care of my mother. Okay. Uh, and in 2019, right before the PFL finals, my mom had a stroke. And um, she's recovering. She's doing great. Obviously, good. she's, good to she's doing much better and much better health now. Um, but her husband at the time, Bob, who is really the rock of the family, um, he was kind of taking care of all of the kids, taking care of her, you know, literally while she's in the hospital, he's running back and forth and, you know, he's staying with her and other people are helping with the kids, but he's doing it all. Um, and then she came home and, and then the pandemic hit. And then in May, um, of last year, Bob very suddenly passed away. Jeez. Uh, yeah. So my mom was left, you know, not only recovering from a major medical, you know, a stroke, um, but she's also grieving the loss sure. of. Um, no, he was your stepdad, you said? Yeah, he was. I mean, my mom and, and he were together later on in my life. Okay. So were you close um, to him? We were close. Yeah. I mean, he was I they started dating probably. I mean, after the. Probably 20. Yeah. I mean, he's been in the family for over 10 years. I mean, we were close. They, he, he and mom were best friends, you how, know. How are you? Um, how are you with dealing with it? Um, I mean, to be quite honest, I've, I've dealt with a lot of loss in my life. Mm. Um, and I don't know. I just kind of felt like it, it was my job to step up and be the rock. So I don't know if I really gave myself time to properly grieve. Um, but probably something you need to do, though. Probably, for sure. Um, it's something that, you know, I still work through and work on. Um, but it was my job to, you know, I needed to come home and take care of my mom, take care of my brother, take care of my family, take care of now my kids. Um, and... You know, it's something that I wanted to do. It wasn't like no one forced my hand. No one asked me or, or, you know, my mom, my mom was like, oh, I can do it. And I mean, physically can't do it. No, (laughs) Emery is two and Kyla is eight. At the time he was one and a half and she was seven. Mm -hmm. And I've ever had a one and a half year old, but um, yeah, no, no, there's no way. So, um, you know, I went home I helped my mom take care of some stuff packed up the kids and we drove down to Florida together. Um, and they've been here ever since. And we, we are our own little wolf pack now, <laughs> you know, we're our own little family. Where, where was your mom living at the time? 
Um, she lives in Ohio. She still lives back in Ohio. In Ohio. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I know that's where you originally from. Then you went to Mass. Yeah. Then you went Mass. down to Florida. Yeah. So my whole family still lives in Ohio. Everyone. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So they're back in Ohio. Okay. Yeah. Um, so now you're in, you're in Florida, um, mm-hmm. Coconut Creek area. Uh, yep. The the American Top Team. Can I ask you how your how your stepfather died? Um, Bob was uh, the reason I said we're going oh. too personal. So, um, my sister and my brother are actually my half brother and sister. I didn't really even like know that until I was older. Um, so my stepdad, who I called my dad, um, he also passed away. So oh, okay, gotcha. I'm buried two men now. Um. She's probably the strongest person I know, um, all the stuff she's been through in her life. Um, but Bob, I believe it was a heart attack. Yeah. And yeah. it wasn't, was he, was he sick before that? Or was it unexpected? Yeah. So he was on, um, he was retired. He was a retired firefighter, um, and, um, paramedic. He had like back issues, stuff like that from wear and tear over the years, but he wasn't, he wasn't unhealthy. He was just, I honestly swear to God, I think. You know, his heart just like he just got worn, worn out. You know, I mean, Kyla had been with my mom and Bob since she was six months old. Um, and then um, they got Emery when he was six months old as well. So they've been raising babies, yeah. you know, at a much older age in life. And with, I'm assuming they're close to what, 50, late 50s, 60s? Yeah. My mom just turned 50. But late fifties, late fifties. Yeah, Bob was in his late late fifties, and she was she's in her. 50s. Yeah, she's at the age where you start thinking about retiring, and instead she's raising. I mean, if you've ever had a, t- I I have children. Two, yeah. like your your experience in two, and they call it the terrible two. Wait till they hit three. Wait, um, wait till you hit three. I mean, the thing about like him getting older is now he can actually communicate with me. So it's like for me, it's better. Like if he's throwing a tantrum and stuff, like. At least he's communicating before the crying and like the mo- the hardest part about all of it was just how overwhelming it was. Like I just didn't know. I had never been a parent. I had never. Sure. I mean, I didn't have time to prepare for it. I didn't. There's no manual for kids. Like it, in fighting and judo and every other aspect of my life, it's like okay, if you do this, you get this result. Sure. Parenting. You know, that's just not the case. Like, that's not how it works. So for me, it's the scariest, most overwhelming, terrifying thing I've ever done in my life. But it's also for sure the most rewarding. Like, it's definitely, um, I've never been happier. I've never been more fulfilled. I've never felt um, more at peace than I do now in my life. You know, I feel like um, my family in general has a very long history of trauma just kind of shitty stuff you know mm. and now i have this amazing opportunity to help break for that you know i have this amazing opportunity to to change Kyla and Emery's life you know to give them a good healthy happy stable environment where they're loved and protected and safe and they're given the opportunity to grow and flourish and thrive into whatever they want to be. There's not going to be, you know, they don't have to be MMA fighters or judo players or, I mean, be I, kids. About, yeah, they're just going to get to be themselves. And I mean, I, I'm very, I'm very scared about that because I feel like it's a huge responsibility and I don't want to mess it up, but I'm also really excited that um, hopefully, hopefully I can change their lives, you know? Yeah. Sure. It's, that's beautiful, and I'm I, I'm I'm sure you're not going to mess it up at all. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so no, you're, you're single, correct? Yeah. Okay. So you so not only did you bring these in, but you're doing it by yourself. You're a single mom on top of it, which is being a parent is tough enough, but being a single mom and then it's like almost having twins because you got two at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And then you know you had to register them for school, for the older one, and. Well, yeah, I had no idea how to do any of that. Was late with all the paperwork. Was like crying. They wanted this specific paper that they told me they didn't need, and called the school. Hi, oh yeah, I've been through like, oh yeah. When the school I, when the school's giving you a hard time, do you ever do that? Like, do you know who I am? Do you no, know I could break every bone in your body. No, now maybe somehow, you should though. But I would never do that. No. <laughs> 
See, I'm not confrontational outside of the cage. Like, I just start crying. That's what, that's, that's it. I, I just, like, more out of, like, frustration at myself and, like, my lack of knowledge than anything else. But that's my, like, in practice, cry. Upset, cry. Angry, cry. I don't know what it is, but it just gets, like, the... Just you. That's how you express your emotion. I, I just get it out, and then I'm all good. Like, I'm fine. You know, you've been, you've been a parent for a little bit now. What would you say has been the hardest adjustment? I think just learning patience. Um, that's been my big, my biggest struggle and learning how to be, um, you know, my kids are not me. They're not, that doesn't, it's not good or bad. They're just, they're not me. They're not, they're not going to do things the way I would do them. Completely different personalities. And I think also, Kind of figuring out how to be the nurturer and the disciplinarian at the same time, like, is very, I used to be the fun aunt who, like, hopped them up full of sugar and took them to Disney World and then said, all right, I'll see you. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know? And now I'm like, no, eat your broccoli. That's right, yeah. It, it's, <laughs> so, it, it's easy when you get to be loving aunt who's, who's can just have fun and, and, and it's the, when the kid's getting up in the middle of the night, wants to sleep in your bed and yeah. that stuff, that's when it's tough. Yeah. And I mean, we have, I feel like we've really gotten it down. We have a great, great system now. And we have, a, a you know, I have found ways to balance being both, but it, it's still a daily struggle. The patience thing is, I mean, I think I'm always going to struggle with that. I think I just am a naturally, uh, I'm just a go-getter. So when you're not a go, like when you're not like that, I don't understand. And Who's like that at two? You know, who's like that at eight? It's not like a natural thing. So it's, I have to slow everything down. I have to find patience and grace and, yeah, you know. How how about the um, most rewarding? Let's flip it because because there's nothing better than having children. What's oh the most God. rewarding? Like, uh, I can't. It's so, I mean, all of it. Like, when Kyla first moved here, she was like 32 pounds or something. Um, at seven years old, she was. Really? Close to malnourished. I mean, she's very petite for her age, but, and again, I think it was just like, you know, my mom is exhausted. Bob is exhausted. They're like, okay, have the macaroni. Okay. Have the pancakes. Okay. Have the whatever granola bar. Like it it was just kind of like, it was hard for them. So, you know, now she weighs 50 pounds. Um, she eats, she wouldn't even eat, she would not eat would not eat any type of protein whatsoever right. so um to see her wake up every day and eat eggs when she used to scream you know i want to go home and like i miss my mom and like just stuff like that um to now her like waking up and helping me make eggs and yeah. her eating you know grilled chicken for dinner and eating like all of these different you know a very healthy balanced diet like she still does it really slowly but at least she <laughs> does it not screaming and cry like that you know she weighs 50 pounds she's healthy she's grown um to see that happen was amazing you know her when she first moved here she was deathly afraid of of water like literally would not get her head wet in in the shower like couldn't do it now she's doing front flips into my pool like yeah. dive bottom you know just like seeing her blossom and seeing her sort of start to like feel safe enough to to be a little bit fearless, to be a little bit badass. Yeah. yeah. Um, just makes me like, oh my God, it just makes me so happy. Like I look at pictures of her from a year ago and I think about like, man, those first couple, especially for her, right? Because, you know, she had lived with her mom before. She had seen her mom before. She had lived with Lovey. That's what they call my mom. And Bob, and then Bob is just, you know, first Lovey goes to the hospital for weeks on end. And then Bob dies and he's just gone. Like, and then she just gets picked up and moved to Florida. And I mean, she knows me, she loves me, but it's not like, but she's six at the time, right? Yeah. Seven. seven. Seven, Sorry. Seven at the time. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a huge, huge adjustment and, um, they don't understand death. They don't get, no, no, don't understand. Didn't, didn't understand really what happened. Like we talk about it a lot. We still talk about Bob, you know, we talk about, we have like, I have books that we read about, you know, the heartstrings to heaven and stuff. Like I, I, we sure. tried conversation about it, but she didn't know what was happening. And 
Um, I'm sure she was terrified and totally. she's just, at the age where she's supposed to be learning how to read or, or learning the ABCs. Like she's at that age. Instead, she's dealing with the yeah. death, death of the man that took care of her and the physical oh. ailment of the woman. And now she's with another person and she's in a different yeah. state. And yeah, yeah, no huge, like huge obstacles to overcome. Um, and I'm just so proud, you know, Emery, the most rewarding stuff with him is like, well, I mean, I had, I've had him since he was one and a half. So I, I think that the, like he calls me, she calls me mom now too, but he always called me mom. Like the first thing he said was, I love you, mommy. And like the first time he said that, I like, you died. I thought I would die. Like I was yeah. like, oh my, I cannot take like my heart just like. It was going to burst, you know, I, I can't even, ugh, it makes me like tear up just thinking about it. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it's, and I mean, he also is like, he's starting to come out of a shell and like we had worried, you know, he had to be assessed to make sure that, you know, he was um, developing on time and Kyla had some, some developmental issues when she was younger. So um, just to see how far they both come, you know, he talks up a storm now and, to see his like imagination, his little faces that he makes, his, you know, he jumps in the pool now with Kyla. Like it's like, you know, he's starting to learn how to ride a bike. And that's something that Kyla at eight year old, eight years old is just now learning, but he's going to be like flying around at three, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. It's um no, I mean, all of it is rewarding. You know, it's just like all of these little moments. Yeah. I don't know. It's hard to describe. But- you said this huge change from Kyla when she first got there and she – I said that right. Kyla, you said? Kyla, yeah. Yeah, Kyla, when she first got there, you know, she was scared. I want to go home to mm-hmm. now calling you mom and being happy. What do you think was the change? Like what – was it that she felt your love? Like what do you think it was? Yeah, I mean I think it, I think that – um, yeah, for sure. I think the, the consistency, you know, the, the faithful – the just like the fact that I'm always going to be here. I'm not going anywhere – you know, I tuck her in every night. I help her say her prayers. I wake her up every morning. I pick her up from school. Um, I like she has she has we have built up that trust, you know. Now she can trust that someone is always going to be there for her no matter what, you know. And we talk about it. You know, I tell her no matter what happens, I'm always going to be here. Like I'm not going anywhere. You're stuck with me. You know, even if you know, it's something we don't talk about a lot, but even if your mom comes to get you, or even if, you know, something may ha- like, you're, all, I'm always going to be there. You have my phone number memorized. You know, I know everything about you. You can always be honest with me. You can always talk to me. And I think her just knowing that, um, having that security, having that safety, having that, um, reassurance, having that love, you know, I mean, I am a firm believer that there's no such thing as too much love. So, I'm probably annoying at times to my kids about how lo- how loving I am, but um, I think that that's really helped her feel happy. You know, I mean, maybe not not even she just feels like she can be her. You know, now she's starting to make friends and she's going to school and we go to church and she has you know she goes to tutoring and she goes to gymnastics and she has she has a life here. You know that she's developed and she's. Um, She's like too busy even for me now. She's like, I'm oh, mom. I'm gonna go to Sarah's house. Like, she has like a best friend next door who she hangs out. Like, I don't know. She's just she's she's made Florida her home. She's so resilient. She's so strong. She doesn't even know it yet, you know. Yeah. But she's there so much, and she'll be able to get through anything in life. Yeah, she's been through so. Much. She's been through more in life at seven years old than people who's seventy years old. Yeah. Yeah. Do, does she, uh, do they understand, I mean, obviously the, I know the one year one doesn't, but does Kylie, Ky- Kyla, I'm sorry, Kyla, does she understand like what you do for a living? Yeah. Yeah. He understands too. Oh, he does. I mean, he's one, he's one though. Oh, he's two. Yeah. He's two. He like just round and pound on his stuffed animals and stuff. So I'm like, I got a little bit of trouble coming my way, I think with so, him. <laughs> but so you, you, you know, you don't have your normal nine to five. You're not a banker. You know, you're not, no. a, you, you know. You, you don't yeah. work that you travel around the world and beat people up. So what do you yeah. do when you have to travel? Um, well, so like if it's a short, like for the last one, I had to be in a bubble for 17 days. Oh. Um, so I took them with me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, was I was like, I'm, 
I'm not leaving my kids for 17 days with anyone. I don't care who it is. So um, I took them with me and we had a great adventure. You know, we made it, we made it fun. Um, I was extremely stressed out, but they had a blast. They didn't even know. They were just like, yeah. this is cool, <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. So, um, and then for this one, I don't think I'm going to have to go as long. So my mom is probably going to come down. I do have a nanny who comes um, okay. while I train. So Izzy will be here and then my mom will be here um, most likely with them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so so let's talk about – I want to talk very briefly about MMA for one second. Okay. And Because you already answered these questions. But the, you have the queen now. You're now the queen. Um, yeah. It was a very different side of you that I don't think we've ever seen before. Yeah. You've always kind of been the golden girl, the very nice, like friendly. Uh, yeah. You were, you were the, you were the bad bitch for a second. <laughs> uh, wait, I know you explained and you kind of had a very um, cryptic message. Uh, what, what is pissing you off? I mean, nah, it's not even that I'm pissed off. I'm just like, I guess I'm pissed off for greatness. Like, I don't, you know, like, what, whatever. Like, I'm not Miss Congeniality. I'm not this, like, saint. I'm not this, like, golden girl. Um, you know, I try to be. I try to, to live by the right, you know, standards, yeah. morals, and, and values, and I hold those dear. Um, but it, you can't win – like this game, this sport, this this friggin' thing, if you if you play by my rules all the time necessarily. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was just a, it was just a warning shot to everyone. I'm just letting everyone know, like, it's not a dig at anyone personally. It's not. I'm not trash talking. I'm not hating on anyone. I'm not calling anyone out. I'm just letting the world know that I believe in myself. Um, to my core and I truly believe that time will tell I know I'm not there yet like everyone's like oh what are you talking about blah. you fight and blah and I'm like okay I'm not talking about now but I'm telling you by the end of my career you will know that I'm one of the greatest if not the greatest yeah that's it what are you happy with the PFL <laughs> um excuse me <laughs> uh um, I'm going to take that as a no. No, it's not a no. It's not a no. It's just like the problem is I do really believe in the PFL. Like I do believe in the system. I believe in it being sport based. I believe in it being in the fighter's hands. I believe in win or go home. I don't, I truly believe that that is the future of the sport and that is how things should be run. Um, I just haven't, I just feel like I haven't been treated, uh, I don't know. I don't, yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy. No, you're not. <laughs> like, I mean, I'm not, I'm not unhappy. Like, I, I have nothing to, I'm thankful for the opportunity to compete. I'm thankful for everything the PFL has done. I feel like we together helped build something. Um, and I hope it stands the test of time. And I hope that, um, the powers that be, you know, continue to try and be better and do better because that's what I do every day. I continue to sure. try to be better and do better. So I hope that they do the same. And I think that that would make everything a lot better. Yeah. So we're going to continue to reverse back. So first we did what's going on in life. Obviously, MMA career. Before MMA, you, uh, like I said, you won these two small judo tournaments <laughs> called the Olympics. Uh, yeah. I believe you're the only uh, American ever to do that. You went to not only did you win it once, but you won. You defended it. Uh, you talked. You've been very open about the, and I don't know what it's called, but it's it's very common for Olympic athletes. They train their whole life for one moment. They accomplish that moment, then it's a. Uh, that's it. Like now, I'm done. Like, yeah. Wow, okay. What? What? T t explain that to people, because obviously winning the Olympics is the highest of highs. But then you hear so many athletes right afterwards they hit the lowest of lows. Explain that to me. I mean, it's just, you know, it's like you spend your whole life obsessing about this one thing, this one goal, this one day, this one moment, um, and you don't really have a plan B. Like, 
it's not in your DNA. It's not in your makeup to like, well, what if I, you know, what net, like you just, you're focused, you're a type A person. You're a, you're a, you're a, the point one percent of the population who is, you know, you're just, uh, you, you're different, you're built different and that's your goal and that's what you're going to do. And, um, then you reach it and you're like, Oh sh- shit, <laughs> there's like, there's this huge cliff and I just ran to the top of it and ran right off of it. Like yeah, yeah. free falling, like, where am I going? What am I doing? Who am I? What is my goal? What is my purpose? Like you, I mean, I literally went from, you know, never even, I don't even know how to explain it. Like I would go from waking up at 5 a.m. obsessed every single day to like not even setting an alarm and like sitting on the couch and like watching Netflix all day, which I had never, like never done. It was you, no. And I was like, oh my God. Oh my God. Um, like the night I won the Olympics, I had a panic attack. Like I woke up in the middle of the night, like pouring sweat. And I was like, what am I going to do? Like what, Wait, what's next? Hold on what's- a second. You won the Olympics. And when you say the night Olympics, are you saying like, like you won it. And then hours later you had a panic attack. Yeah. I won the Olympics. This is the first time. A second time. I won the Olympics a second time. I knew I was done with judo. Like I knew I was retired. I knew I couldn't do it again. Didn't want to do it again. Was at peace with my career. Um, you know, you go get drug tested and you go to the press conference and you go to the USA house and you go to the NBC, blah, blah, blah. And you do all this stuff. And then you see all of your friends and your family and your teammates and you drink. And then you like, you get back to the room in the middle of the night and like, I couldn't sleep. And then I like fell asleep and I woke up and I was pouring sweat and, um, I started crying. I, I was with someone at the time. My boyfriend at the time was like, "What? what's wrong? Like, what the hell? And I was like, D- what am I going to do? Like, it's done. Like, it's this it's this thing that I've done since I was six years old, since I moved to or since I was six, that I've sacrificed everything for, that I've literally given my life to. It's done. It's gone. That's it. Do you, did you feel like you lost a little bit of your identity because you had a goal that you were always chasing? Yeah. I mean, it, it, that's, that's what it was, you know, that's what it is. Like, that's the type of person I am. I need something like I need a purpose in my life. It wasn't like, Oh, I'm going to miss judo or, Oh, I'm going to like, I won the gold medal, but I feel it. like it was like, I need a goal. I need something to wake up for. Sure. I need a purpose. And one night, one night, one night without a purpose, I was like, oh, God. That's it. That's it. <laughs> yeah, you think about it like if, if, if you're going to live, say, 80 years. Say you're going to live yeah. 80 years, you know, you spent, what, 22 years of it or whatever trying to chase this one goal. Yeah. And then it's done and you're like, wait a minute, I still have 58 years or something, you know, left. What, yeah. what am I going to be known for? Let me ask you this. So what got you over that? MMA, but, but, my, but so my, my, MMA, um, just finding new purpose in life, you know, finding, finding new passions. Yeah. So how long did it take you to decide that MMA was going to be the passion? Um, I mean, I started training probably like early 2017 and then like a month after I started training, I went to my first bar session. Mm-hmm. And I think like that moment, like the first time I got punched in the face, I was like, "Oh, I'm doing." It. Okay, that was <laughs> it. That was it. So, yeah. so my question though is, is you got to really prepare yourself because you said, "Hey, I want to be the best ever. That's your goal." But then it's going to become a time when you're going to reach that goal too. You yeah, but I, like, I, will it happen again? No, I mean, I have kids now. You know, I have. I have a foundation that I've worked, I'm working on. I think that, um, you know, father time waits for no man or woman. Unfortunately, like my body already feels 10 times worse than it did five years ago. And I'm sure five years from now, it'll feel 15 or 20 times worse than it feels right now. So, um, my mind is as strong as ever and my passion is as strong as ever. And my, my fire is as strong as ever, but I'm, I'm not an idiot. Like I know that I can't do this for like forever. So I'm going to enjoy every moment of it. Enjoy the journey. Soak it all up. 
become the absolute best, most savage, badass I can become. Um, and I've also learned from my Olympic depression, you know, I've learned that I need to have a plan in place. I've learned that I need to like start taking steps now for my future so that when, when I do decide to put the gloves away, um, I'm not left with this gaping hole of what now. When, when you're 50, you're 60, what, what do you think you're going to be doing then? Do you want to stay active in these sports? Um, you're 60, geez. Um, I mean, do you want to stay active in these sports or it will be something like, else? Like, like um, coaching or participating? Yeah, like, like anything. Like, will you be Yeah, if, I mean, I think that I'll always like, yeah, I think I'll always be involved in some way, shape or form in martial arts. I think it's just a way of life, you know? It's yeah. not something that, um, for sure, it's a way of life for me. It's not like a, I don't even think it's an option. Yeah. So you spend, you said that you've had other things added to your life. Obviously, your children is going to be your number one passion. You also said the passion of, of your foundation. If it's mm -hmm. correct, that's called the Fearless Foundation, correct? That is it. All right. So the Fearless Foundation, and, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, it's basically it's a foundation to bring um, awareness to mm -hmm. a – I don't know if I can even say the right word, but um, sexual assault, especially yeah. to children, is yeah. extremely popular. It is way more yeah. popular than people can understand. You obviously yeah. know this because you've dealt with it. I yeah. know this as, as as I've been pretty honest on on the YouTube that I I'm a detective. Mm -hmm. Also, it's mm -hmm. one of the things, one of the crimes I would deal with almost on a daily basis. New stories, stories that will absolutely break your heart. Twelve year old girls, yeah. younger than that, older than that. Yeah. Um. What ex What does your what What does your foundation do? Like what? Um. Well, the goal really of the Fearless Foundation is two, twofold. Uh, first of all, I mean, I have huge plans for the foundation. Let's just start there. Right now, it's in its infancy. But the goal, the first goal is education, right? So I wrote a book with um, two um, psychologists and psychiatrists from McLean Hospital. It's called Fighting Back. Um, and it's not a memoir. And it's not a textbook. It's kind of a combination of both. So it literally uses my journal entries from when I was being sexually abused. Um, and it talks you through what it is. You know, it shows you what grooming looks like. It shows you why kids stay silent. Um, it shows you the court process and how damaging that can be at times to ch children who have, are victims of sexual abuse. And then you have you know, the, the psychologist on the other side explaining like, this is why, this is how the grooming process works. This is, um, this is why the court process, how, how it may be difficult for your child. This is how you can talk to your child. If you think something is going on, this is yeah. the resources you have. Um, and then I think it also gives a little bit of hope, you know, cause it, at the end of the day, like I'm very lucky. I'm one of the few who has a very, um, I have a very happy ending to my story. Yeah, you know, I, I have a shiny gold medal at the end of, of the tunnel. And, um, the goal is to help those who are in it know that they're not alone and know that there is hope. And it's also to educate, you know, it's also to, to educate, um, teachers, parents, you know, detectives, um, doctors, people who are around kids a lot, you know, social workers, um, I, a lot of psychologists reach out to me and let me know that they use it as a tool to talk to their patients who may have suffered from, um, sexual abuse. But ultimately my goal is for it to be a learning tool. Like I want kids in the seventh grade health class. Like I remember learning all about stranger danger and safe sex and, um, like nowadays they probably learn about cyberbullying or like, uh, sure. you know. Stuff like that, but do, is there any educational material on what you should do if someone close to you tries to take advantage of you? Because studies show that it's, it's almost never. It's 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 someone you know, and it's never the guy in the van at the park. No, it's not. That's not a real thing. Like it's not that never, Yeah, there's no there's no trench coach. There's no you know boogeyman. It's almost always someone you know, and it happens way more than we realize way one in four girls and one in six boys will be sexually assaulted by the time they're 18. And those are just the kids who finally end up saying something. That's so the correct. chance it's probably higher, much higher. It's much, much higher than we realize.
So I want us to talk about it. I want kids to learn about it. I want them to have to talk about it. I want, you know, I want the world. I mean, we've had so many God awful, you know, crazy things happen like with Nasser and with Sandusky and like, we've had all these scandals mm-hmm. like, and we've started to have conversation and we have the hashtag me too movement and we have all this stuff happening, but we need to ed- not just like, not just talk about it and say, this happened to me too, but how do we prevent this from happening? How do we actually change the landscape here in our society so that the numbers aren't one in four and one in six. How do we make that number go down? And that's by educating ourselves, educating our children, educating the people who take care of our children, um, and continuing to have a dialogue always yeah. open, open dialogue. You know, I, I know with the gymnastics, the um, and they're very, I mean, there's a big, huge uh, name. Those gold medalists, as you know, you know, there was going on during the, the you know almost the whole team. You 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 wonder how you know how long it went on where. All happened to all these girls, but they didn't talk to each other about it. They didn't say anything. They always- yeah, I, mean, not, I don't. I don't buy it. Like, I don't. I don't buy that. I think that the powers that be like probably shushed a lot of it up just because they didn't want um, a scandal, and they didn't want to stop their gold medal factory farm. Sure. But I don't. I, there's no. I mean, how many girls were affected and 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 were victims? How many athletes were victims? Like. You're telling me not one single role ever said, you know, like, of course. Yeah, people were, of course. I'm with you. Yeah. I wonder how many they just said, hey, you want to be a gold medalist? Yeah, no. You, know, you can't train at this facility if you say something. Right, right. right. You, you know, and you know how, how competitive it is. I mean, if. No, of course. Like, you know, you're. We'll give you a spot to somebody else. Right. No, of course. No, it's yeah. sick. <laughs> your, your scholarship to train at this facility will go away and, and right. the next girl in line will take it. Um, so. If you don't mind, I want to ask about your story. So, yeah, they say that one in I think they say one in six mm-hmm. even get reported mm. of people who've been sexually assaulted, and I think the number might even be higher than that. Oh um, you know, uh, your story, ha, yours was your judo coach, my- so it wasn't like it wasn't the scary stranger. Yours was a guy you trusted. Yeah, of course. How, how did this? You talk about the grooming, and I I know what you mean by grooming. Can you explain to the listeners what you mean by grooming? Yeah, I mean it's not like um, so. Grooming is the process of slowly, you know, desensitizing a child to sexual advances. Um, it wasn't like it happened one night, boom, bam, done. Like slowly over time, he groomed me. Um, you know, some a lot of times it starts with like tickling or. Um, like rubbing of their back or things like that. I'm um, I'm around the shoulder while they're teaching them. Yeah, I'm yes. doing. I'm de- I'm daddying. I'm a I'm a daddy yeah. figure. Yeah, yeah. Just all things like that. Um, over time, that's that groom brainwashes your child. Sure. Into, like uh, almost like needing that attention and wanting that attention. And like actively seek like, oh, this is good. This means I did a good job. Um, when what what age did this start happening to you? Um, I was eight. But it wasn't reported to, I believe, what you were teenage years, right? 16. I'm sorry, yeah. what you broke up? Sixteen. Mm-hmm. So yeah. for eight years, this guy um, was sexually assaulting you. I'm not gonna ask about the details, but it. How, I mean, do you still carry these scars all these years later? Um, yeah, of course. I mean, I think that that's something that no matter how old you are, um, no matter how high you soar, no matter how far you've come, like, it's always going to be a part of my history. It's all there. It's exactly like what you said. It's a scar. You know, it's, it's. You can't see it. I'm not physically wounded. I'm not, I don't have a limp. I don't walk with like a, sure, a cane, but I have scars and every once in a while they act up, you know, I have good days and bad days. Um, I think that a huge key for me has been turning it into something positive, you know, using my story, um, to help try and be the change in the world that I want to see. 
I think has has helped me immensely. And and I also I did the work, you know, I didn't just like um for a long time I tried to just put a band-aid on it and pretend like it didn't happen. Like it didn't, you know, when I was a kid especially. But I mean I still go to therapy once a week right right now. I, you know? I was gonna ask you next. Yeah. Like I, I still go to therapy to this day for years. Um and that's not because I'm crazy or because um, you know, I have breakdowns all the time or because I can't deal with my past. It's just because I believe that mental health is just as important as physical health Absolutely. and my mind in check. You know, I want to keep exercising my mind and, and pushing my, pushing my, um, mental boundaries and making sure that like I am on the up and up, I am taking care of myself. I am keeping myself whole and happy and healthy and filled. And, um, I am dealing with whatever demons or scars mm-hmm. or, issues or traumas, you know, mental health to me is like another huge taboo in our society, something that people don't really like think about or talk about or like I I literally every night I visualize and I, I go through positive self imagery and I talk like I journal and, you know, I, I train my mind the same way that with the same intensity and the same way that I train my body to be successful, you know, because it's, it is another tool, you know, and it's, to, in my opinion, it is the strongest tool in my arsenal. It is what's going to make the greatest. It's what's going to make me the, the whatever, not, not even an MMA, but just the best possible version of me every single Person. day. You know? Yeah, exactly. You can, you can live life without your, one of your hands working. You can't live life with, without your brain working. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was talking to my partner, uh, Ben Duffy. We do recap show. We do preview show. We do a lot of shows together and. We were talking mm-hmm. about uh, there was an MMA fighter who's been pretty honest with his struggles with mental health, and it, it is you're absolutely right. It's definitely like a stigma. Uh, I think it's been better. I think it's something we finally acknowledge. We're probably way too far behind than we should be. We probably For should sure. be further. And it's because you know there was a time where if 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 you struggled anything mental you, you know mentally wrong with you, oh throw them in the loony bin and forget yeah. about them. And it's like there wasn't proper treatment and. Yeah, we, we don't look. If you had cancer, if if, if it not, you know breaking news, Kayla Harrison gets cancer. She's good. You're gonna go get treatment, but oh, right. Kayla Harrison struggles with bipolar. She struggles with depression. She struggles right. with right. whatever. Oh, we ignore it. Well, and it's it's we something's wrong with that person instead of being like no, it's a disease just like right. cancer or diabetes or. And I would argue that it's even harder for men. Oh, probably. Like, way bigger stigma for men, like. Oh, he's soft, like, that's- I, which is that's definitely like the mentality that I find. And I'm not even like literal, like those are diseases, you know, like the, no, these absolutely. are not, which is can- why it's important for someone like Mara Ranala to be so open. Right. Right. For sure. It's huge. What that does. So let me ask you this. When, so you were being sexually assaulted for eight years and, and please don't take this question the wrong way. I, I, I don't mean to victim shame. Why, mm-hmm. why did it take so long to report? Um, because I was groomed, because I was brainwashed, because I was, what? you know, the first time I, I mean, I was eight years old and I wanted to be an Olympic champion. And then I was um, 12 years old and I wanted to be an Olympic champion, but I was also suicidal. And, but I also thought I loved this man and I thought that this was love. And then I was you're 12. Like, yeah, I'm 12. Like my I'm, my six year old son says he's going to marry the six year old girl next door. Right. I hate to break them like no, you're not going to marry that girl. No, but it's yeah, and it's something like literally your brain's not developed to understand the difference between right and wrong until you hit puberty. Like that's when you start. That's when those thoughts and and questions and real like that's when that starts happening. And I had already been in such a fucked up environment from a young age, like I was literally disassociating. I was like, I had two minds. I had two lives. I had two, like, it, it didn't even seem weird to me. Like it was normal. It, it, I had no idea, you know? Absolutely. I mean, you're, you're a kid. If you put a kid in an environment, don't tell them it's weird. Yeah. You, you think about these cults. You think about a kid that was raised in a cult. They don't realize it's right. I have no a cult right like they're just like they're just living oh that's just normal i mean we think about people in different cultures whether it's right or wrong but if you grow up in a different culture that's that's just how it is you're like you see things though you see the world differently um 
what age did you, did you think you started realizing like that it wasn't right? Like that, that you didn't view this. When did you stop viewing this guy as as the guy who's going to help me win an Olympic title and the guy who had the answers to win it? No, this guy's actually a scumbag. Like when did you? I mean, that was years after uh, after I finally said something. I mean, I was literally, you know, I when I told what happened. Um, when I finally came out and said what had happened, I, I really thought like, it was just going to be like, all right, like she just won't go there anymore. You know, she's going to quit judo. Like I had no, I had no idea the repercussions. And then my mom goes and, and she fought, presses charges, obviously, because she's a able-minded adult who's thinking clearly. I mean, she wasn't thinking clearly, but she was thinking clearly enough to know like, no, this is wrong. Um, and then the FBI gets involved and I was like, I moved to Boston and I'm like sitting there, you know, crying and, and my new coach Jimmy's office telling him like, you don't understand. I need to go to jail. It takes two to tango. Like I was saying these things to him as a 16 year old kid. And mm -hmm. he was like, Kayla, like, I mean, it took therapy and again, years of therapy to, to work it out. But like, he was like, no, it doesn't. You're a kid. He's an adult. If someone did that to my daughter, I would kill them. <laughs> you know, like. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of like the repetition of hearing that, that finally. Like, would, would, you, would you say that, and, and um, I want to be extremely sensitive when I say this, but would you say that the mental abuse that this man gave you was worse than the physical abuse? Um, yeah. Because I mean, I said it really, I mean, it just like, you know, it kind of fucked me up. Like <laughs> he stole a little bit of your childhood. He stole your no, purity. No, he um, I mean, like we're getting personal, but like, I'm not really sure how to be in a healthy relationship, you know, like it's still something I'm working on. Like it's something that I've struggled with my entire adult life because I've, I learned it wrong, <laughs> you know, like I introduction to a relationship was the worst evil possible. Yeah. Yeah. So have, did, have you had trouble trusting men after this? No, it's like almost the opposite. I trust too. Like I, I dive in because I'm like, because of the, the hit past. I don't know. It's weird. I'm, I'm a little weird when it comes to relationships, but I'm more, <laughs> Uh, um, how about, how about the judo community? How, how did they react when they, the news first came out? Um, most people were very, um, supportive. I do remember there are like some judo, there's like this thing back in the day called the judo forum. And there were like people arguing about like, I used to be obsessed with it and people would argue about like, well, what is the age of consent? In some countries it's 12 and some countries it's 13 and some countries it's how old was she really? And like that really messed me up for a while. Like reading people a say, forum about a yeah. 12 year old girl, 13 year old, 15, yeah, whatever. That messed me up when I, because I was 16 and I'm reading all this as I'm going through the court process as the FBI is like, you know, I mean, it's just like a lot of stuff. Like it, it, it can be really traumatizing. That's why I always like encourage people, you know, you don't know what anyone is going. Like if I see someone at the gas station, I smile. If I, you know, if I'm going to a restaurant, I hold open the door for the person behind me. Cause I remember being that girl and like thinking everyone was staring at me and like having panic attacks and like wearing baggy sweats all the time and keeping my eyes down and not wanting to look people in the eye. Like I remember being that person and I don't ever, you don't, who would say something like, who, why would you ever say something like that or do something like that? Cause you're a shit bag. Not yeah. you, but that person who wrote it on it. Like if you, yeah. but that's why it's so funny to me in MMA. Like now it like, now I kind of like laugh about like, there's so many like keyboard warriors like fans in MMA like they're like the worst I think they are just so the mean things they say to, to fighters about fighters to fighters the things they say to me about me to me and I'm just like man if you only knew like yeah I, I, like he I, I, there was a famous bad. one with uh Paul Felder I, I give this guy on Twitter some credit he said something like oh Paul Felder you're a better commentator than a fighter you suck at fighting 
and Paul and, and I'm paraphrasing. I don't remember exact words, but Paul Phillips. Yeah, Paul he, he said, "Would you say it to my face?" And he's yeah. like, "Absolutely not. You'd kill me." And I'm like, "You know what? Good. At least, yeah. Like, at least like, you're admitted. I'd kill you, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, did anybody else come forward? And, and I'm sorry for not knowing this, but nobody else no. came forward on that guy. No, just. Do you just think me. he did it to anybody else? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, science suggests that it probably, like, most likely, you know, ba based on, on the profile of a predator. But for some reason, I think maybe not. Yeah. I mean, it's been such a public story. Like, why wouldn't, you know, I've been very vocal about it. So is, I think that someone would come forward. But but you know how it is. You know how the majority, yeah, course, majority don't come forward. Of course. That's true. But usually when they do come forward, it's usually the first person. And I mean, we, you think about yeah. the, uh, you know, that movie on spotlight, they waited to, to, to right. I don't know if you've seen the movie with someone yeah. come forward and same with yeah. the, um, I, I can't think of the guy's name, but the, where the me too thing came from the Fox news guy and the gymnastics guy and the Penn state guy. And, you know, yeah. because, and, and, and the sad thing is, is that this is going on somewhere else right now. No, I know. I mean, but, but tons of places of no, no, you know, I mean, football like, camp and, and – Like this is what's so crazy to me too is like this is just in our little part of the world. Like I'm just trying to change this little part of the world. Like the rest of the world is – oh my god. I can't even imagine what's going on, <laughs> you know? So I – um, we were talking off air beforehand and you, we are, you actually know the same guy that the gym I go to um, – He's a judo, judo and wrestling, and sometimes I I help teach the wrestling because I was a wrestler. And there's girls in the class. I won't show a move on a girl. I won't do it. I will. No, oh, that's probably a healthy boundary. You know, it's it's and it's because I'm because I deal with this so much. I'm so aware. And while it would be innocent for me to actually show a move on a girl, yeah, I don't even want to even put that idea on a parent. I don't want right. them to even think. So. Like the other day I was showing a move and I was doing it to the guy that I turned to the girl and she like opened up her legs standing up for me to like shoot in on and I and I like turned to the boy to like you you do it. Like you're a young boy. Right. You're you're right. twelve, right. she's twelve. Right. Like, I'm not doing it to a twelve year old girl. Right. Yeah. I mean, but that's probably a healthy boundary. Like these are things this is a thing that like is also huge to me that I that like so badly we as parents you know, we want our kid to be the next Tiger Woods or we want our, our daughter to be the next Kayla Harrison. Okay. Kayla, Har Gabby Douglas, you know, Serena, whatever. Like you would never just hand the keys of your car to someone and be like, here, go take my car for a car wash or go take it for a spin. So why the hell would you ever just like drop off your kid or leave your kid and say, here, make my child great or you know like i'm like that it, that just blows my mind sometimes when i think about it like my my daughter just got in trouble for the first time yesterday like big trouble because she like was at her friend sarah's house and she didn't tell me she was going to soccer practice with her friend oh and like where the hell are you don't you ever do this again like yeah you know? oh, absolutely why would, ever, why would you ever leave your kids with strangers like yeah and that's what the talks about a lot too like don't be afraid to like if you do have your kid practicing or tutoring or like show up unannounced walk in that door you know like you don't need a you, that's your child like right you can walk in you can say what's going on you can ask them about this relationship with this uh, adult if you feel like maybe they have a crush or something like absolutely like break that mold don't be like oh, I should wait until they're finished with their piano. No, like walk in that door and make sure they're practicing the piano. Like, That's right. No, you know, absolutely. Pl plain and simple, the good ch children and adults should not be unsurprised. There needs to be more oh, than one. For sure. And, for and, sure. I, and I the amount of kids going on, and, and I'm not accusing anybody by no means, but the kids right. going on trips, uh, the Little League tournament and the uh, wrestling tournament and – no, but, it, it, but people need to be aware it's not just the coaches it's not just it's no, it's the stepdad it's the oh yeah it's the new boy mom's new boyfriend it's yep. it's the uncle it's the it, it, and you know what's so crazy too is most times again 
studies show, science shows, it's the charismatic, it's the, it's the, it's the person who is least, least likely to be suspect, suspected. Yeah. It's the person, you know, everyone flocks to and, oh, they're so funny or, oh, they're so this or, oh, they're just a big kid or, oh, they're, you know, like. The youth pastor that, that yeah. all the kids like being around, yeah. you know, yeah. that he's, oh, he does all these cool games with us and. Yeah. Yeah, and it's and it's not always a single one. That's the other one they think. Like, oh, he has a girlfriend. Yeah. That has nothing to do with it. No, no, but I'm saying, I'm just saying, like, we right. understand that. Right. You understand it because we, we deal with it. You have a, a fantastic book, foundation. What I say. What? I said, read my book, everyone. That's what I say. Yeah. I think that's the perfect part to uh, to end up on. Uh, the show is called Too Personal, as you did, as Kayla was an absolute open book. Uh, I'm going to put in the comments – where to buy her book, also foundation where you can donate. Uh, Kayla, it was so great talking to you. Thank you so much for being so honest. Let's do this again. Um, good luck in the PFL tournament. We all know you're going to win. Thank you. Because it, it's it, what they say. What I shouldn't even say. It's not a tournament. It's a. Would you say Cor it was? Coronation. Coronation. There you go, <laughs> guys. She's Kayla Harrison. Uh, I don't know how often we're going to do these ones. I obviously I got to pick the right people, but. Uh, I got a couple coming down the pipeline, so make sure you check this show out. Tell everyone out. This is a completely different show than anybody else is doing. This is Sure Dogs, Too Personal. I'm Keith Schill, and she's Kayla Harrison. See you next time.